Hello, everybody. It's so good to see you. Uh, this is episode number two of Sound Ideas with uh, me, Ryan Heller. I'm the conductor and artistic director of Chorus Austin. I mean, Carlos Cordero. Hola, people. <laughs> I'm a composer. We're so excited to uh, be with you uh, today. Um, we're going to allow a couple of minutes for uh, folks to be joining us. So we just wanted to do this quick informal uh, hello. We're here in our home, of course, like all of us. Uh, are in our uh, studio area where uh, both of us typically do our work uh, throughout the day. And we also want to introduce you uh, to our newest family members before we get into the uh, the actual class content uh, of this. So Carlos is going to uh, go get them. Um, but as the, uh, the events began about a month ago, we decided that we wanted to uh, rescue a couple of dogs. And as good a fortune uh, had it, the Humane Society got two sweet sisters in uh and let us know and said you know if you if you uh want to keep them together we'd love to have them in your home so we're, we're gonna grab them here come on girls is this sweet pea? Sweet pea. and this is olive they are two years old they are uh, chihuahua mixes um they guess they have some dachshund mm -hmm. and uh some terrier uh in them but they're very sweet uh very good behaved girls uh, we wanted to introduce them to you, our Austin community. So uh, now you uh, now you see our our whole family uh, that we have here, and you can see that they're pretty re uh, reluctant to conduct, but hopefully we can break them of that. <laughs> Good girls. All right, so uh, we were uh, we were invited to do this episode of Sound Ideas uh, called "From the Other Side," and uh, the idea is that. You know, uh, you're used to seeing me, the, the conductor, from this side. Uh, and we wanted to turn that around and talk a little bit about uh, what it's like for the conductor's work, not in performance, uh, when you, the audience, or the listener, are listening to the finished product. Uh, and likewise, uh, we're going to uh, be able to do some exploration today um, with me uh, and you, um, so uh, we can uh, we can actually do a little bit of conducting together. Uh, if you have anything like a baton, um, which is uh, this, some people call it a wand. I guess it could be kind of like a magic wand in some situations. Um, then you know, feel free to grab it. Um, here's a, a makeshift baton in the form of just a kitchen spoon. Maybe you have an uncooked spaghetti noodle uh, you want to use. I wanted to show you this one. But we're going to start with Carlos, because, of course, a conductor can't do anything without music. Uh, so he's going to talk about the, the kind of the beginning of the, the compositional process uh, uh, and how he uh, makes his particular brand of magic happen. Oh, brand of magic. <laughs> I like that. So as I say also in my podcast, the Happy Choir podcast, uh, English is hard, so I will have little, a bit of, little bit of reading here. <laughs> also, today's class will be bilingual, so there will be a little bit Spanish here and there. But don't worry, it's uh, very simple as my lyrics sometimes. So I want to show you first, before I came to be a composer, a compositor, uh, yo soy de Venezuela. Um, and uh, before I became a professional composer, I always wondered how was the process? What happened before we watched this amazing piece on the on stage? And of course, as I learned uh, the process, it's different for everybody. So that's awesome because there is no right or wrong way, which is great for me because sometimes it can be a lot of stress to think, am I doing the right thing? Is this the way that I should be writing music? Any way that you write your music, it's the way. So the um, first thing that I wanted to show you uh, for today, uh, we want to you to think of a little phrase or a three word sentence uh, that I can later try to come up something to set to music and we, we will just play with that. But for today, I thought to use an expression that's my favorite <laughs> fruit, I guess we're going to yeah. call it here. <laughs> There's a little bit of debate in the world. Uh, <laughs> avocado, aguacate, I have also here, <laughs> <laughs> this little guy here. But uh, in I find that in my in my pieces, I explore different kind of texts, and also that's also something very open. You can explore a poem, a letter, uh, 
words from a, a speech, but also I like to explore what comes with simple words, with simple phrases. And for this class, it's, I feel it's perfect to have just the word avocado. And since it's bilingual, we're going to use aguacate too, which is how we call it in Venezuela and I guess some other places in the world. <laughs> um, the first thing that I'd like to know about the piece is what is it that I am thinking or what's the mood that I want to set to this piece? Because at the end of the day, it's my interpretation of the text. So many, many, many people might disagree with it and others will agree, but it's important to know that you have to put what you feel with the piece and what you want to uh, explore and convey to your audience in the piece. Be sure to confidently go with it because sometimes we might feel, oh, this poem maybe might be trans um, interpreted like this or like that. Some other people would think this is sad, this is happy, this is, it's your interpretation. Again, there is no right or wrong because it's our art and it's our voice. So for me, avocados are delicious. They are wonderful. It's my uh, favorite. And I want to convey that excitement with that. I have no idea where the piece will go or what <laughs> this will sound like. But what I like to know is that first feeling. I want excitement in the piece. I want this. I want to people feel how delicious avocado is with the piece. So for that, I use different tools. Many people, let me show this. Many people will say that this process should be sitting in the piano and then figuring out the harmony, the melody, harmonia, melodia, escribir las notas, writing the notes. But for me, it's a little bit different. I have here a book. You see their notes and you see how little I use it. <laughs> I actually, uh, one of my things is that I cannot stay with just one thing but I've been recently open to doing brainstorms. Can you see it? I write words. Um, in a variety of different ways, um, you can even uh, imagine the same word being composed in a variety of settings. Some of you uh, know uh, the Hallelujah Chorus from Messiah. Uh, imagine that setting contrasted with the same word, hallelujah, um, by Randall Thompson, the great American composer, uh, in his slow a cappella uh, setting. It's uh, two very different ideas inspired by the same word. So uh, again, if you uh, are starting to explore the idea of composition, remember, as he said, there's no right or wrong. Everything is subjective, uh, and it's uh, about unleashing your creativity and kind of letting, letting the muse speak uh, and finding whatever it is that you might want to communicate uh, to come out into the universe. So, for example, here's another drawing of a piece that I recently did, Ayúdame, in Spanish, about the situation in Venezuela. We have these kind of drawings that explain kind of the dynamics, how loud it, it is, how soft it is. See that I'm basically translating the music into something else, something visual. I'm very visual, so I like to just try to show what I want in the piece. I sometimes don't know. I have no idea sometimes how a piece will sound, what notes are there. But if I do these drawings, then I know that I have at least an idea saved. Another way, which is the one that I want, that I probably will be using today, because I feel it's the easiest for me. I'm a singer too. And of course, you don't have to be a, a trained singer uh, to do this, but I use my cell phone. We all have one. And we all have apps that let us record in our cell phone. This allows me to basically put everything in my mind. And I don't know if I'm going to use it, but I just hit record and go and sing, I speak. I try to act as much as I want in the piece. And later I will decide, maybe I use five seconds out of 10 minutes. I don't know. But anything that goes in there, it's a brainstorm. And that's the part that I feel we have to be the more open to it, but also easy in ourselves because we are in a place of playing on a, a with toys, trying to see on our, on our mind, where is it? What is it that I want to say with this piece? And for today, I'm just going to brainstorm a little bit of this piece. Um, another thing that I use and that I love is 
dancing, if the piece uh, moves, if the piece uh, conveys me to to try to, if if it if I feel that I need to dance to do the piece, I will because I feel that I discover some other things, and that's been all new for me. I don't know exactly what I'm doing. I don't know if it's correct or not, but again, it helped me to to write the piece. So one of the first things with these beautiful fruits, aguacate, avocado, it's to see the word itself. Words are the thing that we are, I, I feel blessed to have in choral music and in most of the pieces. So I will first of all write the word. I'm going to write both because my text will be avocado and aguacate. Hopefully you can see that. Aguacate, avocado. And one thing that I like to do at first, and I hope that you're uh, thinking on that idea text, little snippet for later. But one thing that I like to do is separate in zero. Aguacate. Let me show you. This is a very, it can happen on a piece of paper, it can happen on the computer, whatever you want. Avocado. See how simple, I don't do, you know, don't try to do much to it, but just to have an idea of what it is, and that will help me to give, to have freedom, to have ideas of what can happen with it. The first thing that I love about these two texts, and as I said, uh, this will be like the world premiere of the sketch, <laughs> um, is that they both have four syllables. So that's wonderful for music, and it already gives me so many ideas. But what I'm going to do is go write that, that idea, go to brainstorm that idea, and let you talk about um, conducting. And think of that phrase, when you have the phrases, let me know and I also bring some books. The history of conducting is, is rich with stories, including a wonderful uh, tale of lore uh, by a French composer uh, named Lully, uh, who is in the uh, court of Louis XVI uh, in the 17th century. Uh, there's a great film uh, about him called Le Roi Danse, uh, The King Dances. Uh, if you were with uh, Liz last week in uh, France, some of uh, that perhaps even lingered on. Um, but the, um, the first conductors, as far as we know, used staffs on the floor to just bang out the tempo uh, that they wanted. As legend has it with Lully, um, his staff had a relatively sharp uh, end to it and was silver. Uh, and in a particularly rigorous performance of a Te Deum written to celebrate the king, uh, he stabbed himself in the foot. And what most people don't know is that Luli was also a trained dancer. So after that accident happened, he said uh, to the doctors uh, who wanted to amputate uh, the leg to prevent gangrene from spreading, no, don't amputate, I would rather die. And lo and behold, that's what happened. Uh, so um, fortunately today, we don't have to worry about such mishaps uh, unless perhaps uh, we get very excited with the baton and maybe have an accidental stabbing. Um, there are uh, great stories of uh, batons flying out of conductors' hands, even breaking uh, in particularly uh, intense passages. Um, but what we're going to do is play with just the uh, very basics of conducting patterns together. And then uh, we're going to watch a couple of uh, video examples and uh, look at one of the most famous scores of all time to talk about some more of these elements. So I invite you now to grab whatever you have. Like I mentioned before, if you have a, a wooden spoon from your kitchen, that can work. You can hold it either way. Uh, maybe you have a, a piece of spaghetti or some long uncooked noodle. Uh, that's great. Maybe you have a magic wand. Maybe you're a Harry Potter fan and uh, have a wand laying around. Um, but this is a, a, a baton, a conductor's baton. Uh, some people do indeed call it a wand, um, but indeed uh, it is a baton. Uh, you want to grip it just lightly uh, in your hand and allow it to rest then between your thumb and forefinger. So you have quite a bit of dexterity of motion with it. And then you can use several points of articulation to convey whatever music we are uh, performing. So that could happen very lightly in the wrist, it could happen at the elbow, and it could happen at the shoulder, depending on what it is that the, the music is doing. So if you uh, are in a place that you can conduct along with me, just feel free to start kind of a, just a simple one pattern. And that is simply up and down. We go down, up, 
down, up, down, up, down, up. Now you're going to notice at my place of down, there's a moment of beat that's called the ictus. And right around here is a, a plane that we want to keep that ictus on. That's for purposes of continuity. So that as the orchestra or the singers look up, they know where that beat is going to be at all times. If we start doing things like this and moving it around a space, then they're not going to know where that ictus, that place of beat uh, is. So you can imagine a tabletop and then you tap that uh, baton on top of the table and that's your moment of ictus. In my very early days of conducting a study, I actually had a teacher who did exactly that, was to put us in front of a table approximately uh, solar plexus high, and just to have us tap, maybe you can hear this, tap the table uh, in front of us. We can get used to that feeling of meeting it in a relatively similar position. Now, this one beat is useful. We can conduct things that are in three, ta, 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 maybe a waltz, Da, 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 for example. Or it could be in two. One, two, one, two. It could even be a fast four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. But either way, it's, it's a very useful gesture. From there, we can expand to two. And that's going to be one, two, one, two. It's like a J. Two, one, two. Now, as we add beats, there are two schools of thought. One is that every moment of ictus should be in the exact same place. One, two, one, two. The other is that one being the big downbeat needs to always be big so that the beat before it should happen somewhere up and out. One, two. So you can see we've moved two over to allow for one to then be bigger and have its more obvious downbeat gesture. Whatever is more comfortable for you is right. I think all of this again is uh, subjective because we all move a little differently. We're all going to feel more comfortable uh, with that. So let's do a two pattern. One, two, one, two. This is very useful for marches. Ta 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 ta. And we feel that sense of two. If you're looking at me from the other side like you're used to, you can see that I'm just tracing that J pattern that way. But again, we're always coming down so that the uh, musicians know when the downbeat is. Now from there, we can go to a simple three pattern, and that's going to always start with down. Then we're going to go out and back up. So we're basically tracing a triangle with the right angle in it, right? One, two, three, one, two, three. And again, you notice for me, my ictus is pretty much in the same place. One, two, three, but three rebounds up to allow me for a big downbeat down. If I'm not using a baton, it's going to be similar. One, two, three, one, two, three. But if you're feeling yourself, move that ictus a little bit out on uh, the non-downbeats. One, two, three, one. That's okay. And you can notice that the downbeat still functions with clarity. Again, from the other side, we go down, out, up, down, out, up. Now the question always arises, what about the left-handers? And the exact same thing is true. If I switch to my left hand, we still go down, out, up. We can still read the beats the same, but the basic function needs to encourage clarity from the musicians. Lastly becomes the four pattern. So we always begin with down, as we would uh, with all the other beat patterns. So we go down, this time we go in for the second beat, then out and up. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. If I turn around, you'll see me go down, in, out, up. Down, in, out, up. So that that four pattern again, maintains the clarity of beats so that any time the musician looks up, they know exactly what's happening uh, in the beat process. Now, with those basic patterns, you can conduct virtually all time signatures. Yes, there are five, six, nine, and 12 in terms of common uh, time signatures, but most of them could fit into one of those. For example, five 
could be broken down as 2 plus 3 or 3 plus 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We call those asymmetrical meters because they are not balanced, right? One beat has more beats in it. Uh, if we're in 9, 8, for example, we, we might want to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And have it be uh, like that. So these are very, very functional uh, patterns that we can adapt most of our music uh, to. Um, now, the, uh, the notion um, uh, behind uh, uh, keeping the beat is only the first uh, piece of the job. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the next elements uh, after we hear a little more from Carlos, who's returned with his uh, initial uh, sketch uh, of avocate or avocado. Uh, and again, if you have a comment you want to type in, uh, send it to us right now uh, for the text that maybe will inspire him to uh, write some music, or he'll just use avocado and see what music might be born uh, of it. But for now, he's going to show you the next element of sketch that he's done. <laughs> Hopefully with something um, that I have an idea or that I have at least a little bit of something that sparks my mind. So something that I realized as I was recording is that both words share the syllables, a and ka. Aguacate, avocado. I don't know if it, that would be helpful, helpful for later, but I like to see these things in the text because then that helps me to try to find something else to say, a, a, a new tool to use while I'm writing. What I did here because of the short amount of time. And uh, to be honest, this is what I used most. Uh, if you go to my Facebook, you will see a Facebook Live that I did. I was on the piano, but I was mostly trying to record those ideas on the phone because I feel then I can come back with another mind, another feeling and see, oh, I really like this one. Oh, that was terrible. Like you're going to listen right now. I'm going to show you a little bit and you're going to be able to hear how much exploration I allow myself to do how much, how I can sometimes doubt something, how much I got of tune, but also how that brings interesting ideas to then travel in the piece. It's just a cool idea that I feel that it helps me to get out of my mind and into the playground that it's writing music for me. Avocado, 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 aguacate, avocado. As you can see here, I'm talking, I'm just talking uh, the text and it helps me to realize the rhythm that it has. I can make something longer, something shorter. Ah, guacate. Maybe that's an, an idea for a piece. Ah, guacate. Ah, bocado. And you don't know what's coming. Maybe that's an idea. Um, let me go. Something that I like for this piece is to have to play with the words. I record notes for myself. <laughs> I, tr I like to talk to the phone and then later I will be like, okay, okay. Because that way I don't, I don't feel I'm losing anything. I'm not writing down anything. This is all I had. My two words. Avocado, 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 avocate. Av for the bilingual part of the piece, then I realized that I can chop the word and do avocate, aguacado. I can jump from one to another and uh, go avocate. I mean, it's just the flexibility that uh, this allows me. Then I go avocado, to sing a little. Ah, avocado, avocate, avocado, avocate. I can actually show you from the beginning. I set up like a tempo. And that was just. <laughs> Maybe nothing of this will make it to the piece. I don't know, but it's fun today. <laughs> Something that I like to imagine is that the choir is on stage just enjoying the piece. So if we think 
aguacate, 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 aguacate. I want to see that that um, movement. I, I imagine that already. Um, there was a little bit here I want to share. Oh, oh, oh. idea. Avocado, 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 Maybe? <laughs> Actually, say maybe in the recording. Then I can continue. Oh, maybe I want a slow section. Avocado, just ideas just then what i like to do with this is to take and pull it apart i have i can make a little post-it with and trying to devise the rhythm that I'm using, the time signature as you were talking for conducting, avocado, avocado. I, I just try to then fix it to a tempo, fix it to a, to notes, and then I try to find the things that I want to use, the order. If you imagine Legos, that could be a good idea. You have the pieces and then you say, oh, this one goes with this one, this one go, and then you start to build the piece, or maybe you can, break down the piece uh, completely and then put a, a section in the middle but with this recording uh, idea it helps me to not think so um, strict with the piece the piece is flexible the piece allows me to do a lot of things and it's a collaboration between the piece and me so if you want to then <laughs> i think that's wonderful i like how he calls it a collaboration uh, between the piece uh, and himself. That's that's spectacular. Um, and it, it reminds me that, you know, everything a musician does is multifaceted, uh, including the work of a composer uh, who is very frequently collaborating uh, with the musicians with whom he might be working. Uh, the great thing about, you know, music today, and we're in such a, a rich time, uh, is that we can collaborate. And uh, many of you know that Carlos and I have uh, worked together. Uh, I've had the, the great joy and honor of uh, conducting several of his pieces. Um, and, you know, we can do the work to find what's best for the ensemble um, that we are uh, working with. And if something needs to change, he's right there to uh, adapt. So perhaps he wants to change a note, uh, an articulation, a dynamic, uh, that in real time, uh, that can actually happen. So, um, you know, pieces evolve uh, as we all do. The, um, the next bit of conducting that I want to share with you uh, are about the, uh, the pieces that have to do with non-beating time. So we were just a, a moment ago exploring the, the beat patterns, and what we can now start to say is, what about the other hand? We don't just want to have two hands uh, doing beat patterns, that's called mirroring. Uh, so the non-dominant hand can be used for all kinds of things. It could be used for dynamics. It can be used for cues as we're going uh, along. It can be used for reminders of phrase. Uh, if I'm working with singers, there could be times where I give them reminders of sound. You might see a shape that looks like that to remind them to maintain height in the sound. I'm pretty famous for using a gesture that looks like this um, to remind them to really enunciate the text uh, and spit it out uh, that way. So there's all kinds of things um, that we want to have um, independence of uh, motion in. Um, obviously, our work is about nonverbal communication. So uh, we have to be able to do as much as possible gesturally so that our rehearsals can run efficiently and the musicians can simply make the um, um, time about their playing and singing to the best of their av availability. So um, right now, I'm going to go into a sharing of screen uh, and show you the first page of a score. So what we are doing um, now is uh, uh, another piece of the conductor's job, which is all about score study and what is going to happen um, when we first uh, approach a score. So hopefully right now you're all seeing the full page in um, the first page of Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 5. We are currently in the um, anniversary uh, year, 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. 
So there's a lot of Beethoven um, that's been going on. Um, this is perhaps the most famous eight notes ever written, right? Ba -da -da -da, ba -da -da -da. It's that famous motive. If you're not familiar with reading music, that's what you're seeing here. And what I want you to notice um, is that the, uh, the information on this screen um, is really quite full. So here at the top, you see the marking Allegro con brio, not just Allegro, but con brio with fire. Um, and then later, um, you see there's a little asterisk and a footnote um, that says Beethoven's metronome marking uh, from 1817 has half note at 108. Uh, so if you were to get a metronome out and hear that, you're going to hear that it's quite fast. And in just a moment, I'm going to play you a couple of different examples so you can hear what might be more traditional and then what that tempo actually sounds like. Now there's more information here, isn't there? You see fortissimo as the opening dynamic in the strings and the clarinet with ah two. That means both clarinets are playing, uh, clarinet one and two uh, at the very beginning. Then in measure two, you see a fermata. Now, how long is that fermata? That's one of the things the conductor would need to decide. Then you see the next bar immediately begins with an eighth rest. Now, historically, many conductors add a bar here. Ba -da -da -da. Ba -da -da -da. A bar of rest. You can see Beethoven didn't write that. So there are now more brave conductors saying, hey, that's a, a performance practice that evolved somewhere in the 19th, early 20th century, but it's not what Beethoven wrote. Let's do that. Ba -da -da -da. Ba -da -da -da. Right? Then, here in measure four and five, you can see that there's now the half note tied to the fermata half note. This suggests to me that it should be longer than measure two, right? So that these two fermatas are not the same because this one has extra time on it. Then again, there's not a, a, an extra bar of rest. And the next event that happens then is the piano entrance of the second violins. So it would be our job as conductors to prepare that entrance and then the entrance of the bassoons uh, happens. There's a lot happening right here on this first page. I'm going to move away from that score and allow you to hear a couple of different examples now. So the first one that we're going to hear uh, is with the Philadelphia Orchestra led by Ricardo Muti. Apparently I need to log in again. <laughs> One moment. <laughs> yes, this is my uh, email. Feel free to email me anytime. And here we go. Not bad. Now let's hear the San Francisco Symphony led by Michael Tilson Thomas. Can you hear that that was a slower tempo with more weight? and almost had that triplet feel on the first eighth notes. Ba, 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 ba. But you can see that's not what Beethoven wrote, if you remember the score. Now, here is two examples of the same conductor. Here's Leonard Bernstein. That was with the New York Philharmonic uh, in his early days as music director. And now here is an older Leonard Bernstein with the Vienna Philharmonic. Sure. 
I think it's very interesting that uh, his tempi are virtually the same, but the amount of time between the uh, uh, bars goes down in the second performance. Uh, and there's many great examples of that. Now, uh, if you remember the score, you remember that it was in two, uh, and it began with an eighth rest, followed by those three famous eighth notes. Ba -ba -ba -ba. So we probably want to conduct it in two, and we want to give that sense of fortissimo strength from the onset. So if we, if we were going to conduct it, we want to be certain that we prepare that forte. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, to, to propel that motion. Also, we want to encourage that fermata to not diminuendo. So some sense of strength uh, from the left hand uh, would be uh, very appropriate. Then remember, we probably would want to avoid adding the extra time. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba -ba -ba. The only time perhaps we'd want to consider that is if we were in a very reverberant acoustic where that sound is lingering and we need to allow it to dissipate uh, a bit. Uh, the composer Bruckner is famous for putting fermatas over rests for that very reason. Music being performed in very live halls and so he accommodates the acoustic by allowing the rest to be as long uh, as it uh, needs to be. Now, you also know that the styles of conductors are as varied as there are personalities, right? Um, so there are, there are very fiery uh, demonstrative conductors like Leonard Bernstein, very physical, looks a lot like the music that's going on. We could call that a, a, a school of Dionysus, as it were, uh, right? And then there's the other side, the, the conductors uh, who really want to get out of the way of both the music and the musicians uh, and allow it all to speak for itself, um, which we could call like the school of Apollo, Apollo and Dionysus. I personally like to have some element of both uh, in there. I think like everything, it's all about balance, uh, a balance of masculine and feminine energy, uh, a balance of uh, dominance and elegance. Uh, to quote a, a friend from Canada named Erin Howden, she taught me that concept, I love it. Um, so that we all have flexibility to really approach the music that we're making um, with the spirit that it has. Now, of course, there are all of the functions of a conductor that happen off the podium as well, right? We are uh, part administrators, uh, educators, fundraisers, uh, marketing uh, people. Um, uh, at times there are elements that we are counselors and spiritual advisors. Uh, to our musicians and even public uh, that we interact with. All of these things go into the very multifaceted work of, uh, of being a conductor. So um, let's, let's remember that as well. Um, uh, lastly, I just want to say that uh, as a musical leader, we also want to take into mind our planning, right? We have to be efficient time managers, uh, especially when it comes to rehearsal to be certain that everything can get done in the allotted time uh, that will facilitate the success of the musicians uh, in the performance. Uh, and then of course, partnered with that is programming. Programming music that our audiences want to engage with, programming music that is interesting to our musicians and to our audience that perhaps challenges us in some ways that we can meet the music at an appropriate level. Maybe we want it to challenge us to develop some new method of musicality and have it elevate us up that way. Um, but programming is a, a, another a very important uh, idea uh, that we as musical leaders uh, uh, get to encounter. Um, I see uh, a question that's popped up. I'm gonna read it out loud so Carlos can hear it too as he's finishing sketching over here. Um, you say, Carlos, thanks. Do you often have a melody first, then you choose a key, and a chord progression, or is it the other way around? Okay, so um, thank you for that question. I was just doing that normally because uh, I'm a singer, I have a melody in mind, or I have some kind of melody in mind, and then I put chords to that. That's the most common way that it happens. Uh, I was just setting this, um, a lot of people and myself sometimes ask where to find, where to find the text. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, because I've been exploring to write my own text, I also been uh, exploring just cutting out of books and making my own, my own phrases. Sometimes they don't make sense. Sometimes they make sense. <laughs> I was just setting this here on the piano, uh, so you could see another way that I write. Um, and this is a wonderful question. 
Andrew, because the it doesn't come always in the same way. But sometimes I'm not a great piano player, so and you will actually see it in a second because I'm gonna play it. Uh, it says here, night either sleeps nor dies, it burns. And uh, I have a simple setting that I just did um, with a piano. Again, I'm just playing. I don't know if it will be the one that I like the most, if it will be exactly what most conveying the idea of the piece, but let's see if I can play it <laughs> number one and then uh, you'll see where this idea came from. Can you? Yep, I will. I will angle it for you. Okay, so they can see. So for this, I have this, this melody. Night neither sleeps nor dies. That was the very first thing that I did when I played the piano. So I decided, okay, let's do this. They will uh, shape their piece too, once more. So, uh, if that were the case, uh, if I were thinking about that night that he was just doing, if I can remember it, because of course we don't have a score yet, but I might want to do night and encourage a little bit of motion in that phrase, neither sleeps nor dies. And it sounds like there's a phrase that would happen there for a little lift, and then encourage the piano. But notice this hand would still softly be marking time so that the very elements that we started with are still present uh, in our music making. Um, as we said at the beginning, we could go on and on and on uh, all day. So if you have any thoughts or questions, go ahead and type them in now. We're just going to uh, start wrapping up uh, here because um, uh, the idea, uh, you know, uh, of learning everything about composition or everything about conducting just isn't going to happen uh, right now. But we hope at least you've got a little glimpse uh, of what it's like to uh, to be on the other side, uh, both of uh, a conductor and uh, a composer. Um, so go ahead and send your questions uh, now. And, um, you know, as you listen to KMFA moving forward or you're in the audience next, um, you might be able to uh, notice time signatures. Maybe you're going to pay more attention to that. Maybe you're going to notice chord progressions, um, melody and harmony a little bit more. Um, there are tremendous resources now where you can go online and see sketches. Uh, from uh, composers. You can learn about the history uh, of a piece. Uh, it's really terrific. So uh, it looks like we've got some things. Um, oh, I love that you love the thought process. I'm, I'm yes, sure yes. you're talking about him. Yes, yes. Uh, and Pam, Carlos has a beautiful voice. He does, really. It's a, it's a tremendous uh, thing to get to listen to his, his creativity here. 
Um, and then, uh, yeah, you notice the dueling pianos. Oh man, sometimes he's in uh, his office around the corner. I'm hearing this piano banging out scores and yeah, that, that can create quite some dueling piano action uh, in there. What is the ratio of male to female conductors? That's a spectacular question. Uh, and unfortunately, in the realm of professional conductors, it's still a very male-dominated uh, profession. There are more female conductors than ever um, at this day and age, and that's more true for professional orchestras uh, than anything else. When you go down uh, to uh, semi-pro and um, community orchestras, it starts to expand a little more. When you start to build in choirs and uh, schools and churches, uh, then it really starts to uh, balance out. But in the world of professional uh, conductors, uh, it really still is a very male-dominated uh, profession. So um, another question for Carlos. With so much music in the world, how do you know what's original? That's a very, very good question. And I know I don't know anymore because, uh, well, first of all, I don't know all the music. And of <laughs> course... I do, yeah, and of course I do a lot of research to be sure. At the beginning of the piece, I always feel, ah, oh, this is, is this mine? <laughs> Did I just listen to somewhere and I'm just <laughs> silly because it's easy to feel that something that we do then is not original. Both because uh, our own mind gets in the in the way, but also because there is so much music out there, and of course something it's going to sound like something else. Uh, it gets dangerous when it's a lot that it looks like it <laughs> if it's in text if it's in rhythm in music in melody but uh i will say i i try not to be too afraid anymore of something like uh something else because it's going to happen it's inevitable um because we're just uh, putting together the same things we're putting together notes or putting together voices and then what makes it different is when you allow yourself to combine things and go to places that uh, you, only you will go there. Terrific. Um, Tabby says, uh, introduce ourselves and our profession again. Oh, absolutely, Tabby. My name is Ryan Heller. I'm a conductor, uh, the artistic director of Chorus Austin uh, here in town. And I'm Carlos Cordero, full-time composer and now creating the brand The Happy Choir, where you can all find my music and all of my podcasts, blogs, etc. Terrific. Uh, please, where have I conducted? Oh, that's a, a long question, uh, Tabby. Um, so before I was here in Central Texas, I was in the Northwest, uh, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, there I conducted the Southwest Washington Symphony, which is obviously in Washington, uh, for a decade. I had a professional choir called the Portland Vocal Consort. Uh, I had a community choir that I uh, started called the Columbia Chorale of Oregon. Uh, and also a women's chorus called the Pride of Portland Chorus. So a lot of things kept me very busy up there. Uh, I would guest conduct, uh, uh, I still do, uh, all over the place. And I have the great honor of uh, being a clinician and guest conductor uh, around the world. So uh, thank you very, very much uh, for asking about that. Um, and what would we say to Tabby's four-year-old is listening to express your passion for music? You have a, a thought about that? It's just plain. I feel that uh, for me, music, it's having fun with it and letting myself feel not only the, the joy, but all of the emotions that are there and exploring with that, allowing myself to, <laughs> that's a test of the <laughs> fire alarm. <laughs> um, allowing myself to just feel the music and let yourself play with it, with instruments, with your voice, with everything that's around you. Anything can be a, an instrument. I have right here two markers so I'm going to use, you know, you can use on this avocado. Maybe this is what I'm going to include with the piece. I'm sorry for the <laughs> alarm. <laughs> it's a test that they're doing here on the place. Um, anything can be, a, so grab anything that you have around and try, try and play with it. And how can you come up with a piece with that? see more questions i had to comfort the dogs <laughs> oh, so uh, i also wanted to say about what he was just talking about with um you know the, the passion of music uh for your uh four-year-old um is is everything is is good right we, we want everyone to feel that music is approachable 
And, um, uh, you know, there are those teachers out there uh, who have been known to say, if you can't do it, great, don't do it. Uh, and that's not how either one of us uh, approach music, right? There's there's a place for everyone uh, in this world of music making. So, you know, bang on a piano, let your voice fly, uh, play on different instruments, uh, and, and, you know, just, just have fun uh, with it. Um, did you start with singing and playing an instrument first, Ryan? Uh, cool question. I actually started on the violin. Uh, was my very first instrument. So uh, I came from a musical family. My mother is a singer and my father played the trombone. So I had those things going on um, in there. And uh, I decided when I was about eight years old that I wanted to start being uh, musical. Uh, and I thought the violin would be the, the thing to do. So I played the violin for a few years. Then I segued out of that, um, but stayed in the orchestra on the clarinet uh, and ultimately uh, married in saxophone uh, to that. Uh, and then finally, it wasn't until high school um, that I began uh, singing. I would be singing along with my family. Um, and it turns out, you know, that there was a voice in here uh, that I could do something with. Uh, so that's how I came to singing uh, a little bit later on. Uh, and I'm very fortunate that in all of my studies, I've never had to choose between conducting choirs or orchestras, but I could just work twice as hard uh, and study both. So um, that is it um, for, uh, for my uh, history. Um, I think we're gonna wind down. Uh, so uh, I wanna say thank you again to KMFA, uh, to our producers, uh, Todd and Kat, uh, who have helped to make this uh, run so smoothly. Um, be sure to tune in next week uh, to Sound Ideas, the exact same time, Thursday, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, and you're going to be hearing about how to build your own instruments, which sounds like a cool thing uh, that we can be exploring these days. If you want to know more about uh, Chorus Austin, check out chorusaustin.org, uh, and you can uh, also find me right here on Facebook, Ryan Heller, um, you know, happy to engage and answer any more questions or uh, thoughts that you might have. Yeah, you can also find me, my music, and all of the things that I do in thehappychoir.com. There is a podcast, a blog, and also if you find my email there, carlos at thehappychoir.com, be sure to just send me questions or your music or what you do, and I'm always happy to engage and talk about music making and the process, because it's just fun to see what other people also come up with. So, so happy it. playing, conduct along. Uh, with KMFA, maybe go make some sounds and uh, see what's born. Thank you all for uh, sharing some time this afternoon with you, uh, us. And uh, stay safe, uh, stay well, and we'll look forward to seeing you um, as uh, you know, the situation allows us to. All of our love. Bye-bye. Ciao. Muchas gracias. <laughs>